Welcome to SCOTUScast, a project of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. Our contributors join us from around the country to bring you expert commentary on U.S. Supreme Court cases as they are argued and decisions are issued. The Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. joining us for this post-decision episode of SCOTUScast, Subpoena Quashing Edition. I'm your host, Bridget Flaherty. On April 3, 2017, the Supreme Court decided McLean Co. v. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. In 2008, Damiana Ochoa filed a sex discrimination charge under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 against her former employer, McLean Co., a supply chain service company, when she failed a physical evaluation three times after returning from maternity leave. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, launched an investigation into Ochoa's charge, but McLean declined the EEOC's request for pedigree information, meaning names, social security numbers, addresses, and telephone numbers of those employees who had taken the physical evaluation. The EEOC then expanded its investigation into McLean's operations nationwide and possible age discrimination, issuing subpoenas to McLean for pedigree information regarding these matters too. McLean refused to provide this information as well, and the EEOC then filed actions in federal district court to enforce the subpoenas issued regarding both Ochoa's charge and the EEOC's own age discrimination charge. The district court quashed the subpoenas, finding the pedigree information irrelevant to the charges, but the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, applying a plenary or de novo standard of review, reversed. Other U.S. Courts of Appeals, however, apply a more deferential abuse of discretion standard in such situations, and the U.S. Supreme Court granted certiorari to resolve the split among the Courts of Appeals. By a vote of 7-1, to one, the Supreme Court vacated the judgment of the Ninth Circuit and remanded the case. In an opinion delivered by Justice Sotomayor, the Court held that a district court's decision whether to enforce or quash a subpoena issued by the EEOC should be reviewed for abuse of discretion, not de novo. Justice Sotomayor's opinion was joined by the Chief Justice and Justices Alito, Breyer, Kagan, Kennedy, and Thomas. Justice Ginsburg filed an opinion concurring in part and dissenting in part. And now to discuss the case, we have Ellen Springer, an associate at Baker Butts. The stakes in McLean versus the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission probably seem rather low, even to most lawyers, because the court granted cert to determine only one narrow question. How should the Court of Appeals review a district court's decision to quash or enforce an EEOC subpoena? Should that review be de novo, which the Ninth Circuit concluded in the opinion that triggered the court's review? Or should it be the deferential abuse of discretion standard, as all the other circuits to consider the question have held? Asking the question that way, of course, practically gives away the answer. In short, the Ninth Circuit was wrong. It is now the law of the land that the courts of appeals must perform their review deferentially. But the importance of the case lies in how many other areas of law could be affected by this rule. So I want to talk briefly about the EEOC subpoena practice and how this particular case arose. And then we'll briefly cover the Supreme Court's resolution and why it matters. The EEOC, like many other executive agencies, has the power to subpoena information relevant to the charge under investigation. This subpoena power is reviewable by the district court, whose role is merely to satisfy itself that the charge is valid and that the material requested is indeed relevant to the charge. Relevant is, as all who have taken evidence in law school know, a very broad concept. It includes virtually all material that might cast light on the allegations against the employer. In the underlying case, the EEOC was investigating a Title VII suit filed by Damiana Ochoa. On her return from maternity leave, McLean, Ochoa's employer, required her to take a strength test, as it requires all its returning employees to do. Ochoa failed the test three times and was dismissed. In the course of investigating McLean's strength test policy and whether it constituted discrimination on the basis of gender, 
The EEOC subpoenaed the names, social security numbers, last known addresses, and telephone numbers of all McLean's employees nationwide who had taken the strength test. McLean refused to comply with the subpoena, and the district court refused to enforce it, finding that the so-called pedigree information was not relevant to whether the strength test was discriminatory. The Ninth Circuit reversed, using de novo review, despite the fact that all other circuit courts use a more deferential standard. This lopsided circuit split gave rise to the CERT grant. At the outset, this case is unique in that the EEOC itself declined to support de novo review, which led the court to appoint Stephen Kinnaird as amicus to argue in support of the Ninth Circuit's judgment and thus in favor of de novo review. Mr. Kinnaird discharged his duty as amicus admirably, but faced something of an uphill battle. As McLean argued, the long-standing and nearly universal practice of the Courts of Appeals is to review all administrative subpoenas for abuse of discretion. The Ninth Circuit, alone in applying de novo review, was not even clear in its opinion about why it applied de novo review. Moreover, in terms of relative institutional competence, the district court is better placed to determine highly fact-bound questions such as relevance. The district court is not only more likely to make better decisions, but also to do so in the most efficient manner for the parties and the judicial system. The Solicitor General, on behalf of the EEOC, also figured deferential review. But its brief argued that even under a more deferential standard of review, the district court nonetheless erred in this particular case by applying the wrong test for relevance, because the requested information, identifying others who took the strength test, would cast light on Ochoa's complaint. Against this nearly universal consensus in favor of deferential review, the amicus arguing for de novo review made a clever argument. He contended that district courts do not have discretion to determine whether a subpoena is enforceable, and therefore their decisions cannot be reviewed for abuse of that non-existent discretion. The amicus further argued that district courts owe agencies deference, and that double deference by the appellate court is analytically impossible. Finally, the amicus compared administrative subpoenas to searches by law enforcement, which are reviewed de novo for reasonableness under the Fourth Amendment. The court was not persuaded. In a 7-1 to opinion by Justice Sotomayor, the court acknowledged the near-universal and historical practice of deferential review as well as the relative institutional competency of the district court. The amicus's view of the district court's role in reviewing administrative subpoenas was too narrow because deferential review is not just appropriate where the district court has wide discretion, but also where the district court's decision deserves to be insulated from appellate revision, as here, where the district court's position gives it superior vantage of the case. The court also rejected the amicus's argument about double deference, rejecting its premise that a district court gives deference to the agency during its review. Finally, the Supreme Court acknowledged that subpoenas are constructive searches, but rejected the argument that all Fourth Amendment searches require heightened review. Justice Ginsburg concurred in part and dissented in part. She agreed that abuse of discretion was the proper standard, but nonetheless would affirm, based on the argument raised by the Solicitor General on behalf of the EEOC, namely, that the district court erred as a matter of law in requiring the EEOC to show a particularized necessity of access beyond a showing of mere relevance. The case has been remanded back to the Ninth Circuit to apply the correct, deferential standard of review. But it's not clear that McLean is out of the woods yet. The Ninth Circuit could decide, in line with Justice Ginsburg's reasoning, that the district court's error was one of law, and therefore an abuse of discretion. However, the fact that Justice Ginsburg wrote alone may signal to the Ninth Circuit that such a conclusion will not find favor with the court. The implications of this case are more wide-reaching than they may appear at first blush. The McLean decision will likely govern review of other agency subpoenas, of which there are many. A 2002 Justice Department report cataloged 335 grants of subpoena power to executive agencies, it's hard to imagine that that number has dwindled in any way over the last 15 years. Had the court imposed a stricter standard, it likely would have invited appellate delays and increased costs across a far wider spectrum of administrative actions. That seems like a bad outcome, 
and so perhaps the court's judgment could be celebrated, even by those who only care about results. Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUScast. SCOTUScast is a project of the Federalist Society, a not-for-profit educational organization of conservative and libertarian law students, law professors, and lawyers, founded upon the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast series, including SCOTUScast and Practice Group Podcasts, on iTunes or Google Play. For an archive of past podcasts, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at fedsoc.org slash multimedia. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash multimedia. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 